Well, it's my honor now to introduce our guest. I will keep it uh, very brief because we're excited to hear from him. Our special guest is Arthur Muir, who at age 75, mm-hmm. hard to believe, um, he's a, a day over 40. Yeah, I'm only 50 now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Became the oldest American to reach the summit of Mount Everest. And that was just last year, not even a year ago. That's pretty amazing. Um, his program is, it's not about the summit, it's about the effort. Um, Art is a retired corporate finance lawyer who began mountaineering at age 68. And he has said, you can do a bunch of things if you just have a dream and set out with a plan and work with it. So my, it's my pleasure to introduce Art Muir. Thanks, thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Ava and um, Carolyn, uh, Bethany. It's been great. I, Carolyn has kind of helped me um, visit and, and uh, introduce me, welcome me here. I have to say, first of all, I'm honored and flattered to, to be here. I mean, you're, you've got an organization here where you as donors are doing really important work, and I can see it just, you know, so obvious from what you've done just in this institution. We can take some of these lessons, I think, back home where I come from in Chicago and do a better job. So when Caroline was kind of um, lining me up with this, I asked at one point, you know, how long should this program be? And she said, you know, I don't want it to be too long, maybe a half an hour. So I see that uh, I have to leave now. (laughs) So, uh, and the other thing I just want to kind of warn you about before we begin, a couple of things. One is, um, it's probably better if you hold questions until the end. I tend to answer a lot of questions um, there are kind of ones that you're probably going to have. I might cover those. And if not, I'm happy to answer questions to stay behind. You know, if you have to get up and after two or three hours and kind of go to the bathroom, that's okay. <laughs> Feel free to do that. And the other thing is Joseph has told me that I normally wander around, you know, I like to kind of wander around a little bit, but he's put this invisible fence thing because of the camera <laughs> got this fence here. So I feel, you know, this don't fence me in thing. I'm kind of working against that. Um, anyway, we're going to get started here some kind of weird thing on my computer and um, we're going to take a trip. I want to take you along and try and give you an idea of what it's like to climb Mount Everest. I was very fortunate to be able to do that, as improbable as it seems, and I love sharing the story with other people. So if this, if everything goes well here, and I, and I do the, um, I, I call it, it's not about the summit, it's about the effort, because I've been to Mount Everest three times. I went there in 1990 on the north side as a trekker, kind of got my exposure to what the mountain was like. Um, I always wanted to see it. I started reading a book called Annapurna by Maurice Herzog. Uh, he climbed the first 8,000 meter peak in 1950. Uh, 8,000 meters means 26,000 feet, roughly. And I've always been kind of captivated by the high mountain concept. So I went there in 1990. Um, and look at this mountain and thought, that's really astonishing that people can actually get to the top of this thing. And I never really had any idea that that was gonna happen. I went back in 2019 and um, tried to climb the mountain. My coach had told me I wasn't ready. And guess what? He was right, I wasn't ready. And I'd worked really hard. I'd actually worked with him. Um, I've been doing a bunch of training, worked with him for a year and uh, got there and, um, Got to camp one, went to camp two, we're gonna talk about that. Came back down. Uh, among other things, I fell in a crevasse. That year, three people fell in crevasses. Uh, year that, two years, that, that year, two people fell in crevasses. And one of them's still there. So you just, that's not something you do. You don't make that kind of mistake. The other thing, I fell off a ladder. Uh, twisted my ankle and that was the end of the expedition for me. And there's a lot of reasons for that. So I came home in 2019. There was no climbing season in 2020, so I had two years to think about uh, what I had done right and what I had done wrong. And the list of things I had done wrong was pretty long and it was really serious. And so when I went back, I did a lot of training, had a lot of time to think about mentally what I had to do. And I'm gonna share some of that with you. So Nepal, normally I have a pointer. So I have a pointer. This is my pointer that I usually use, okay? <laughs> I had to cut it off to fit it in my suitcase. So normally I can reach up to the screen, but this thing is, you're so advanced here, I can't do that. So I could use a cursor, but I'm just gonna talk about it because uh, most of you folks know where this is. Nepal, the green country. 
in the northeast of India, in between China, which is access, you know, formerly Tibet in that area, and India, a long, narrow country where you will find there are 14 8,000 meter peaks in the world, and eight of them are in Nepal. And you can see them on the border, if, you, if, you're, if you're close to that, you can see, if you're looking along that northern border, you can see Everest and Makalu and Choyu and some others. Um, eight are in Nepal, five are in Pakistan, you know, kind of on the other side of India, and one is actually in China. You can see Shishapang, but uh, just below, kind of, the, you go down to the left and down a little bit from the word T in Tibet. Uh, these were created by the tectonic plates, the Indian plate moving northward against the Asian plate, push these things up, and they're actually still growing at the rate of about, I think it's like a, a quarter of an inch a year, something like that, but they're still, they're still rising. Uh, so how do, we, how do we go about doing this? The first thing we have to do is we have to fly into Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, take a small airplane into Lukla, which has now adopted this moniker of the world's most dangerous airport. And the reason for that is it's, there's a giant mountain here. The airport runway ends at the mountain, flows downhill and then drops into a valley. So when they land, they land uphill so they can stop fast enough. And when they take off, they take off downhill so they can be going fast enough. It's, uh, it's interesting, it's interesting, <laughs> it's interesting. And the year I was in 2019, I was there. Um, I had actually, when I left, I came out, you know, I was coming out, so this was about uh, May 15th, I think it was, a little bit early. And one of the planes, these fixed wing planes, taken off down the runway, got halfway down, took a right-hand turn, crashed into a helicopter and, and killed three people. It's just one of those fluky things. So was that a, a, a pilot error? Was that a maintenance error? I don't know, but you want to fly on those in good weather and as seldom as possible. You start this climb at the bottom where that yellow loop play is. This is just, it's hard to see, but it just shows you how mountainous the area is. That red line is kind of the track, the track that you follow. And it takes several days to actually get from Lukla, where you start walking, up to base camp, up in the top, you can see that mark is in the yellow. And you can see that's kind of where Everest is over to the right. But it takes about eight or nine days because you're gaining a lot of altitude. Base camp is 17,000 feet. If you went right up there, you'd get sick from altitude sickness. So it's really important to get yourself acclimated. The amazing thing is people have climbed Mount Everest without oxygen, without any help at all. So they stood on a mountain that's 29,032 feet high. But if they were, you know, if you took them there from sea level, right up there, they'd lose consciousness and die. So your body, even though it can't stand a sudden change, can actually adapt over time, which is incredible that you can actually do this and still survive. So you take a lot of time to do that. Plus, it's a really wonderful, interesting country to go through. The people are great. So I'm going to show you now. Let's take a look at this. Again, you have to look. Look for the red dot. That's actually the top of Mount Everest. And um, the, green, the green thing, if you can see that to, the, to your right, is the top of Lhotse, another 8,000-meter peak. And you can see that on the right of that coming down is a mountain called Nupsi, I think that's also marked with a green thing. Mm -hmm. That creates a valley called the Western Coom, which is the Valley of Silence. And this is where the route goes. It goes up this, I have to point a little bit. It goes up this ice fall, Google ice fall, and up that valley, up the saddle between uh, Everest and uh, Lhotse, and then up the flank of the mountain. We'll see some more of that. This is the south side. On the north side, you can actually see, oops, I'm not supposed to vary. I have my fences here to see. <laughs> On the north side, I'm going here. <laughs> this is um, Kangxi, which is the mountain that's off the left. They come up that, they come up the wrong way, and then up, up to the saddle there, and then up to the top. The north side tends to be, um, and be a little bit steeper and a little bit colder, but it doesn't have the objective danger of the ice fall, and you're going to see why. So, how do we climb this mountain? The thing about Everest that most people don't understand is you don't just climb the mountain, you know. Uh, if you go to Colorado, you want to climb a mountain, or you go to Rainier, not not like Bob Rainier, okay, not Bob, Rainier, okay, not like that. You um, basically kind of go there and climb it. You get you know you get kind of nauseous. You don't feel really good. You get to fourteen thousand feet, you come back down. That's not how Everest works. You have to acclimate through what they call rotations. So you actually climb the mountain three or even sometimes four times. You go into the ice fall the first time to kind of get used to it during the daylight. We don't like to go in the ice fall during the daylight because it is uh, the most dangerous time. The ice fall is a frozen river of ice that moves three to four feet a day. Huge blocks of ice, and they're, 
and they're moving. You don't, you don't perceive that. But as they move, they'll topple and crash and collapse. So they're very dangerous. So you want to climb when it's cold and when the ice ball is most solid, when the ice is frozen the most. Then what you do is once you've done that, you've kind of gotten used to it. You go into your first rotation. You go from base camp up through the ice ball, spend a couple nights at camp one, go to camp two, spend a couple nights, and come all the way back down. And the teams on Everest have just done that. That's exactly where they are. Uh, the people I use, I just got some, I actually got some texts this morning from people who just come back from camp two. So that's the first rotation. Then you rest and recover, maybe do some acclimatizing hikes in the area, kind of, you know, just kind of a not ice type stuff, a lower level stuff. And you go back again and you're no oxygen. You're not using oxygen. So you go through and typically what you do is you go from base camp up to camp two. But this year that I climbed it, the ice ball was, took longer than it normally did, so we couldn't get, it just took too long to get through it. So we went to camp one, spent some time, then climbed to camp two, spent some time, and then climbed to camp three. So you're starting to get up there now, 24,000 feet, with no oxygen. And that climb from camp two to camp three is really steep and really icy and uh, can be kind of scary. Then you come back down to camp two, spend the night, and come all the way back down to base camp. Now you're ready after some rest time to actually try and climb the mountain and do your rotation. And it sometimes typically takes, and we'll talk about this, takes um, seven days, something like that, to actually get up because you have to, you know, you can only climb so much, except for the speed ascent people. There are always people like do it in, you know, three minutes and, you know, 45 <laughs> seconds kind of stuff. But you know, leaving those aside, uh, it takes quite a while to actually do the climb. This is what our camp looked like. Uh, taken from the base of the, of the, but it's pretty typical, taken from the base of the ice ball. Uh, those red domes are um, yoga kind of exercise areas. That's what they're ostensibly designed for. They're actually used by the Sherpas for gambling, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the, the Sherpas are the most wonderful people in the whole world. I don't, you know, that sounds like it's a negative comment. It's not. The reason that we don't pay the Sherpas until we get back to Kathmandu is they always spend all the money and they'll gamble, <laughs> even though they're the sweetest, hardest, strongest people in the world. But uh, they do love their games of chance. Um, the, the tents is on your left, um, sorry, on the left is kind of the dining tent. Then on the right are some of the Sherpa tents. Our tents, which look more like this, the climber tents, um, were back behind, you couldn't see them. But they're quite big. You can actually stand up in them. So they're pretty cushy. You know, they're actually pretty cushy. Have like a little foyer with a little <laughs> chair there. It's, and you have um, milk cartons with a with a cot with a you know kind of a rubber pad on it, and uh, it's pretty nice. Except you know, it's like you know, ten degrees every night, and you know <laughs> it's dark and uh, it's windy, and you know, you get used to it. But here's our dining tent. They're nice, huh? That well, that's actually that astroturf has plywood underneath it. It's stored at a place called Gorik Shep. Now Chuck, where's Chuck? Chuck went up there. He's been there. Um, Gorik Shep is a um, place that's best suited for storing plywood, okay? It's not a place you want to spend much time. <laughs> it's only inhabited half the year during the climbing season. But they actually bring this up every year, these plastic chairs and covers, they drag all this stuff up. And that um, insulated cover that's in the tent, which was new in 2021, keeps it much warmer. There are some propane heaters. Uh, makes it just so much nicer. You know, it's not it's not like this, okay? But it's <laughs> it's pretty comfy, even though at dinner, you're wearing these big parkas and hoods and gloves and stuff like that. It's kind of it's kind of cool. But it's you know it, it's, it's they have in those carafes serve coffee and ice, uh, you know, um, a hot milk and uh, you know, kind of a tea, a milk tea they have, and the food is quite good. The thing about Everest, the other thing is the Kumbu Valley. You can only there are no roads. You can only get there on the by walking or on the back of an animal. That's how supplies get there. Until recently with helicopters, they've changed a lot of it. A lot of stuff comes in on helicopters. So we get a lot of fresh food. Food is actually really quite good. Uh, especially if you like onions and, you know, stuff like root vegetables and things like that. But they have, you know, meat. We have fresh eggs. I mean, just amazing. Because somebody, you know, traveled eggs, so we can have eggs. Um, they, before you go into the ice ball, one of the things you do is you have to have a puja ceremony. Puja ceremonies where they bring a llama in with a priest, and um, that that altar, that stone thing, is was built by the Sherpas. The Nep Nepalese, uh, in general, are known to be really 
accomplished stonemasons. In fact, many of them have been now are being sent to, to Scandinavian countries in particular, Norway, I think, where they have a lot of stone pathways uh, because they have such expertise. They can make, they can make more in um, a summer than they can you know, the entire year just working on those things. But anyway, they, they, they just pick up rocks and put these things together. Then everybody puts something out there. There, Basically, it's a, kind of an offering, and you also put some gear out there. The, the llama comes. It's kind of a blessing. You're asking for safe passage and for, um, you know, from the spirits of the mountain. And this is something you do not mess with this. This is something that take, is taken really seriously. It's taken seriously by the Sherpas. You're dependent on the Sherpas. So they take it seriously. You take it seriously. And one of the, one of the traditions is when you leave camp, you circle that altar. Sometimes they call it shortened, but, and you do it uh, clockwise. And when you come back, you do it again. And I can tell you, I didn't miss one of those circles. All right. <laughs> I wasn't taking any chances with that. And after they get that up, get some sound here. This is just part of the kind of part of the ceremony. It's a very joyous thing for them, but nobody goes in the ice ball before this is done. Then they raise, then they had to have raised that. These are the prayer flags you've seen. They raise those. And once they've done that, it's kind of a signal it's okay to go into the ice wall. This is a picture just to give you an idea of our Sherpa team. About half of these Sherpas are working with climbers. I have, uh, I, I can't point him out very well. My Sherpa, Pasang Bote, who's like my, like a Nepalese brother. I place like a Nepalese son. He's 43, so he's like a Nepalese <laughs> son. But I feel like he's a brother, maybe a father. I don't know. Um, about half of them work with the climbers. The others are up working ahead of you on the mountain because it takes so much effort to put in the camps and to carry the supplies and carry the oxygen bottles. And they don't put the camps until you're ready to get there because the winds will destroy them. But to give you an idea, on our expedition, we had we ended up with 10 climbers who summited. Uh, we started with, I can't remember exactly what the number was, maybe 18. It, 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 what My statistics have been the men, about half the men summit, and all the women. That's true. For this, you know, in 20, 2021, they all summoned. 2019, there were four women. They all summoned half the guys, okay? Um, but we had 350 bottles of oxygen that had to be taken up that mountain. Somebody has to carry those. And that's what the Sherpas do. So they're working really hard to make this possible. And the thing to take away here is, you have to understand this, there's a handful of people who can do this without that kind of support, but basically nobody else. You know, you need the support of those Sherpas. They're making it possible for people like me to do something like this. Um, this is what it looks like. There's a, there's a place between Gorek Shep, which is um, near base camp um, and base camp uh, called Kalapatar. It's 18,000 feet. And if you look at this picture, you'll see in the lower left-hand corner, you can see some yellow probably for the tents. I'm kind of an odd place where I can't see it. But as you look, so that's, that's, those, are the, those are the tents at 17,000 feet. We're standing on a mountain at, at 18,000 feet and looking across at Everest. Okay, so where's Mount Everest? Mount Everest is that little dark thing in the middle, all right? Not very impressive from this photograph. The thing in front of it is the west shoulder. So when you're in base camp, that west shoulder is between you and Mount Everest. So you don't see the mountain the whole time until you actually get up into the ice fall, past the ice fall. On the right-hand side, that big jagged peak there, that's Noopsie. So you can see that. You watch avalanches coming off that all the time. But um, it doesn't look like it here. But standing on that, standing on that thing for the first time, 18,000 feet. I'm looking eight miles across the top of Mount Everest. That mountain, and I'm at 8,000. That thing is 29,000. It's 11,000 feet, almost two miles above where I'm standing at 18,000 feet. I'm looking across there, and I'm thinking, actually, what I'm doing is being really quiet because I'm thinking, you know, this massive thing. It doesn't look like this picture. This massive black thing, and you got to climb up the right-hand side of that that steep ridge. I'm thinking. Uh, what am I doing here? <laughs> and that is, that's exactly, and I'm kind of like, it's kind of like I got my head down. I'm thinking like, these people might belong here, but I don't know what I'm doing here. And to give you a picture, a better, a slightly different perspective taken at a different time and a different expedition. This is actually taken in the fall when there's a lot of snow. Taken from a different perspective, and you can see how Everest just, you know, just, just shoots out of the background above the west shoulder. You know, but you, because of the perspective, it's a pyramid. So when you're down low, you just don't get that impression. But when you get out to the horizontal side, you can see how this huge stands up there. And this is what it sounds like all the time. 
And you know, I realized what it sounds like is Kansas. This is what it sounds like. Okay? That's, that's what I found out yesterday. So here's a picture of here's a picture of Pumori uh, from the Pumori Base Camp. It's a little bit different perspective. You can see more of the ice fall here. So you got to realize, you know, our objective is to walk up this from the base camp up this ice fall up the valley. And I want to give you an idea of what the ice fall looks like. So, oh, before we do that, this is low seat, and that cool bar in the middle. Can my cursor showing up there? I, I meant to make it bigger. I apologize. That's the route to climb Lhotse. And you can tell from that picture, I think, it's really steep. I mean, it's like this. You know, it's it's just remarkable. And I had a very good friend, a guy named Wolf Riley, who was climbing Lhotse at the same time I was doing this uh, Everest thing. Just kind of fun to look over there and think, hey, really glad I don't have to go up that thing. <laughs> so, but here's a picture of the ice fall taken from Kalapatar. And you can kind of start to see how it jumbles and tumbles. And the thing that's interesting to me is, the snow accumulates in the valley, the western coom, comes down and compresses because of gravity, and then it starts to fall over the edge, and it's like somebody sliced it like a, a loaf of bread. You have these horizontal slices where the crevasses start to open up, start to fall apart. Then it comes over this steep part that you're looking at and tumbles and jumbles and just ends up with this really chaotic mass. So if you look at this closely, uh, can you see anything here? You see anything there, maybe? Okay, well, you know, I'll show you what that is. So that's the same spot. That's this, okay? You see those guys? Guys is like men and women, okay? It's men and women. Um, so you, see, you can start to see they're making their way down here. You can actually see it. I don't know if you can see on the, the um, as perspective is there. You can see the, the trail a little bit. But you also see this one right here? See those on the ski jump? Keep an eye on that. They're up here now, okay? See that? And what they want to do is they want to go down here. And this is what they have to go across. And so that's why... That's why people, I know somebody who climbed with the only, the husband and wife, but they weren't married at the time, Tyler Reed, climbed with his wife, Melissa Arnott Reed, the only American woman who's climbed Everest without oxygen. Well, two have climbed, she's the only one that's still alive, the other one's still there. Um, they climbed on the north side because he, as a professional guide, he's a, I've done a bunch of ski, um, backcountry skiing with him around the world, thought the objective danger of the ice fall was too great, just wasn't willing to do it. So they went to the Chinese side, which I think is, you know, and this is somebody who is in the outdoors and evaluates risk for a living. So it's it's um, it's some serious stuff. Um, but here's one of the things that I talked about helicopters. So helicopters are interesting because, you know, they can fly. They require visibility. They're expensive. They now rescue people as high as Camp 2. So if you look at this, Camp 2, 21,000 feet, that saved a lot of people in 2021 because COVID was a huge issue on the mountain. The Nepalese government said, we don't have any COVID here. First of all, they don't have any vaccines, no medication, no nothing, all right? So the people were in 2021 were really terrified by this thing. They all lost family members or friends. But the government said, oh no, we don't have any COVID. It's all uh, altitude sickness. But they were taking them off, people off from camp two. And that, and, and injuries too. It means that if you can get down to camp two, you can be rescued without having to go through the ice fall. Before helicopters, if you couldn't get through the ice fall, and just think about trying to transport somebody who's hurt. I mean, if they can't basically hobble, they're, they're, they're done. But now helicopters have changed that a lot. The um, controversy is, the last point I have there, is that people are using the helicopter to jump over the ice fall. Oh, now, you yeah. can talk about whether or not you feel oxygen is fair, is fair, is there fair play for climbing a mountain. And you can talk about, you know, um, how much support, you know, you need. Is it fair play? But it isn't very hard for me to figure out whether or not using a helicopter to jump over the ice wall to climb Everest from the south side is fair game or not. Okay, it seems pretty obvious. And we saw quite a bit of that actually, um, both going up and going down. And what they do is they're saying, they're calling, saying, um, you know, we have an emergency, you know, coming down. We have an emergency. And then there's just uh, the Prince of Bahrain had a whole bunch of helper bees all dressed up in red and black, nice little uniforms. They all got to, he, count, he climbed the mountain, got to camp two, called in the helicopters, and they all flew directly to Kathmandu. You know, in my book, doesn't count. It's his, his, you know, he's got to live with himself on this. But, but um, I just took some. This is base camp. That's actually all ice underneath that rock moraine, base of a glacier, pretty typical. But these helicopters are coming in really often, bringing all kinds of stuff and taking people out. You know, wounded people out, bringing in supplies. 
our uh, base camp manager and his brother, our, we, had, we had a base camp manager, Bola, um, who, um, uh, Adel, who uh, was with us the whole time we were there. And his brother is in Kathmandu, coordinating things down in Kathmandu. Uh, the two of them, they're just wonderful, native ne Nepalese from Kathmandu. They own the helicopter, one of the helicopter services. They, uh, they've got it. This is good. This is a good living for them. I mean, this is a great gig because they're expensive and they make lots of money on it. All right. So now we have to figure out how to get through the ice ball. So the first thing we do is we practice with a Jumar. A Jumar is essential. Everest is unusual because it's a fixed line climb. Most mountains, um, if you go to, you know, Bill, if you go to Rainier, you're going to be in a rope team, right? You're going to have probably three people, maybe a guide or somebody who's experienced, you know, to be tied to it, that person and then another person behind you, three or four people, you move up the mountain simultaneously. And uh, Everest is not like that. On Everest, they fix lines. Just think about this. Almost from the base of the ice ball all the way to the summit. So almost 11,000 feet of line. Now, there are some exceptions, and we'll talk about a few of them. And what you have to do, the key on Everest is you want to be clipped to that line at all times. And the Jumar is a mechanical device with a cam with some teeth. It allows you to slide that uh, a mechanical device up the rope, it's attached to your waist, to your harness, and then won't come back down. So as you gain ground, you won't lose it if you happen to slip and fall. So when I fell in the uh, when I fell in the crevasse, I had a safety strap on, not a Jumar. But the point was, I was attached to that line. Otherwise, you know, you'd be looking at this wall here. Okay, <laughs> so, so I'm really glad that the guys who put that in put it in and it. And it held. So it's just remarkable how that uh, how how um, effective that is. But you have to. What we're doing there is just um, practicing this on different kinds of uh, terrain in the lower part of the ice ball. And we practiced a lot and got quite proficient at it. Actually, the other thing you have to do is learn how to cross ladders. That picture was taken of me in 2019, and I didn't learn very well. Okay, because I fell off the ladder, hurt my ankle. And the problem is, you can see the regular aluminum ladders. And we have these things, these teeth on our boots called crampons, which are these little spikes that allow you to walk on the ice. When you when you fall off, of one, I was tired. I wasn't paying much attention. I, you know, I was coming down. I kind of overbalanced. And you don't have any handrails. You see, you have these ropes. And the ropes are fixed, but they're loose. So you either have to pull them from behind to give yourself a little bit of balance point or pull them from be, you know, in front of you. But there's nothing to stop you from doing this. And once you get to this point, you, start, you go. There's nothing you can't stop. The problem is that your feet, which have these crampons on them, are stuck inside those railing. And I actually have a picture, not of me, but of somebody else. And the guy is falling off sideways. And he's oh. all the way down here, and his foot is still up here. Because it hasn't pulled the release off yet. Yeah. I thought, yeah, that was not good. I didn't want to do that again, OK? I didn't want to do that again. And the other thing you have to do is learn how to repel. And so starting from the upper left to the middle to the right, you learn how to go down the lines in increasingly steep and challenging terrain. Because, you know, once you go up, that's, uh, as, as Ed Beaster says, you know, getting up is optional, getting down is mandatory. So you don't want to make any mistakes. You've got to be able to get down. And there are a lot of situations uh, on the upper mountain and also in the ice ball where you actually have to go down these ropes and use this rappel technique. So we do that practice a lot. Now, so here's the good news. We've now spent 47 days since we left uh, Kathmandu, going up the valley and getting ready, practicing our rotations. Okay, I'm not taking through all the rotations. We're now ready for our summer. Until then, we haven't even seen oxygen. I've never used it before. And I'm actually pretty concerned about whether I'm going to be able to handle it. You, know, you got this thing in your hand, you got this tank, and you got this valve and this regulator and all this kind of stuff. Um, because I'd, I'd been briefed on it in 2019, but actually never used it. It never lasted that long. So this is the day that we're getting our kind of instruction. Uh, those are two of our guides, very experienced guys. Um, Rob Smith in the middle does a lot of work down in Antarctica. He's done some amazing stuff. Sid Pattison, the guy on your right, um, has done a lot of climbing. He actually was one of the people that was looking for uh, Sandy Irvine after they found Mallory's body in 2018, I think. Very experienced guys. So they're explaining to us how we use these oxygen masks. And, and you use a lot of them. That's my tent mate, Kevin Walsh. Wonderful guy from Nova Scotia, a dentist. Um, we've done a bunch of stuff together now. Some of the oxygen bottles that they've, uh, you know, just to give you an idea of how they store these things, they're all wired together too and also have decals on them because people will steal oxygen bottles. Now, it's one thing if somebody's an extremist and they really need oxygen, 
to save them from dying. You're not going to say, I'm sorry, you know, you can't use our oxygen for that because you're, you know, you, but people just take it because they're too lazy to carry it up. And there's, well, let's just say there's more of that on the mountain than there should be. Now we're ready to leave. Okay. Now we, now we spent this time and this is our Cracker Jack summit plan written on the inside <laughs> of a cereal box, a Wheaties box, I think it was. So we're going to leave on um, May 15th. That's what that 15 represents. And we're going to summit and be back down on the 22nd. And this kind of gives you the sequence from camp two to camp three, you know, I'm kind of resting, get to the top on the 20th, no problem, five days, I'm down in two days and we're back home in, in, uh, on May 22nd. So we left on, in fact, on the 15th, but we didn't get back until the 23rd. We spent a lot of time above at camp two and above, which is pretty unusual because of the weather. There were actually two cyclones, two tropical storms. One came in from, um, the Bay of Bengal and one came in from the Indian Ocean in opposite directions, hit the Himalayas and actually moved across, dumping tons of snow, big high winds. Turns out, you know, we were, we were pinned down in our camp for that. Turns out it was a real blessing because it put a bunch of snow on the Lhotse face and you're going to see how that's beneficial. So to go through the ice fall, like I said, you start at night, 2 a.m., you get up at midnight, uh, get all your gear together. It's a lot of gear. You, you're messing with a lot of stuff. You can kind of see packs and you got headlamps and helmets and you got backpacks and boots and crampons and just a lot of stuff you get something to eat and you start off at 2 a.m walking through the ice fall you can hear these crampons on the ice and you do that for a long time <laughs> a long that's a long night um, but sometimes people take a picture. This was, this was a picture taken with an iPhone, um, lit just with headlamps. And you get these kind of, it looks like a Hollywood studio. Uh, but as the light comes up, which is very, um, very welcome, you know, you get higher in the ice ball. And this kind of just gives you a feeling for some of the different uh, looks. And if you look at the picture on the right, you'll see that it looks like you have some boot prints there, some potholes that people are stepping, the climbers are stepping in. That's because there have been so much, it's pure ice. It looks like styrofoam, but that's in the snow, but it's pure hot, brittle ice. That's because they stepped on it so many times they've actually put, you know, imprints into the ice, which makes it much easier to walk. So if you look just to the left of that climber, try and imagine holding your spikes at an angle, 45 degrees, versus being able to put your feet flat. So it's a huge advantage. And again, it's because porters and Sherpas have made so much, so many trips up and down each time, you know, putting a little, uh, another little foot to in. And of course, every year it's a brand new route because the ice fall has completely changed. So they start from scratch. It's just remarkable. So you get yourself in some interesting places. I'm standing on the end of a peninsula here. Yeah, this was worth taking a picture of. Yeah, this is exactly. Oh, I'm I'm feeling I'm feeling really strong there because I'm like stopped. Okay, and I'm not moving, so I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I'm looking really good. And you can see there that um, that's my Sherpa Pasang just beyond me. We're getting to rappel down, and then. If you look at this on the left-hand side, that's kind of where the route goes on. We're just about the top of the ice fall headed to Camp 2. But this is what it looked like before I walked out there. That's looking back toward the base camp. Yeah. Yeah, those are places you don't want to go, that's for sure. That's for sure. Some of the crevasses are actually really wide. This was actually one of the widest ones. I think this thing was probably 100 yards across and really deep. And you can see on this one, maybe um, there's actually two lines. One's an up line for climbers going up and one's a down line just to keep down the traffic and the bottlenecks. We were coming down, I think, um, I can't remember which rotation, if this was after the summit or after camp two, but uh, after our second rotation, but there was a woman at the bottom from China and we could hear her kind of I don't know, not crying exactly, but making noise. Um, I can't do it, I can't do it, or words that effect. And uh, we were, the, the people coming down behind me started to pile up a whole lot of people. And finally, a Sherpa had to actually carry her, this ladder that you can't see very well, had to actually physically drag her up that, um, that steep face on the far side to get her to the top and out of the way of all those climbers. This is a person who was climbing Everest who had no business being there. All right. Not only was she in danger, she was endangering everybody else. And what happens is a lot of the companies that cater to the Chinese and the Indian climbers charge a half to a third of what the reputable Western guide companies charge. 
and they end up not having the supplies, not having the expertise, and not having experienced climbers. You don't you don't just sign up for this thing without being vetted. You know, nobody, none of the reputable guides will do that. But that's a real problem on Everest. I mean, it's hard to say to somebody you're not qualified. I mean, I can't say that, but I think a guide can honestly say that to somebody. I'm not taking you. Uh, so that's that's a problem. Okay, look in the middle of this picture. This is a traverse we had to do. See that guy? That guy did. That guy. That guy misstepped. All right. And he just he just tumbled off that traverse. And again, if the lines don't hold, he's gone. But you get these iconic, beautiful views. Uh, I didn't take this picture. It's too good for one I would have taken. But it's a beautiful picture. But I just think you get this feeling for how how just surreal and beautiful and otherworldly this place can be. Just remarkable. So as you get above Camp 1, you're heading to Camp 2. On the right, this picture, actually one of my favorite pictures of the climb, that's Noopsy. Very steep, not an 8,000 meter peak and not very often climb. Avalanches constantly. And you can see, perhaps, on the right-hand side, not all those black marks are, um, are climbers. Some of them are gaps in the snow. But you can see the climbing route way on the right. And this is where I talked about how the ice ball tends to be parallel crevasses that you either have to go around or you actually they're not completely bottomless. You have to go down into them and climb up the other side. Just because of the topography. As you work your way from Camp 1 to Camp 2, you see a lot more. But you now finally get to see Mount Everest. You've been climbing through the ice fall. You spent some time there. You finally get to see Everest and, on the left and Lhotse. And as you go through um, this, this climb from Camp 1 to Camp 2, you get a lot of this where you're going down into these um, uh, kind of small crevasses and then climbing up the other side getting higher on the mountain, starting to see Lhotse. And then looking back toward, um, toward the base camp now, that's Kambutsi on the right, Lindgren in the middle, and Pumori, a beautiful mountain on the left. And you're going to see that. I'm going to point that mountain out at some point. That mountain, Pumori, at uh, 20, what is that, 23,400 feet, something like that, uh, Pumori, 23,500, is higher than any mountain outside of Asia. All right? So there is no mountain in the world outside of out of the continent of Asia that's higher than that mountain. And you're going to see what it looks like in a little bit. This is a, this is a, this is a walk basically from Camp 1 to Camp 2, one of the very few relatively um, smooth, um, flat sections of the, of the climb. Not roped. This is one of the few places that isn't roped. So you just have to follow the trail. Before we left, before we left on our climb, Four people that died on Everest already the year we did this. One of them was right there in that section I just showed you. He was um, a Sherpa for um, a member of the royal family of, um, of um, not, oh, I think Oman, I think it was Oman, um, a woman who's climbing. He's a very strong climber, actually. And, and uh, so he had to relieve himself, stepped off the trail, you know, because if you got to go, you got to go. It's just that's just the way it is when you're out there. I stepped off the trail a few feet, fell into a crevasse, head first, 50 feet dead, just like that. They got him out, but he was dead by the time they found they got down there. So, you know, when they say stay on the trail, believe me, stay on the trail. It just shows you how fast and how, how rapidly bad things can happen. This is a picture of Camp 2. Um, the, the, uh, the tent on the left is actually a dining tent, so we could still gather. They actually kept Sherpas up there for the entire climbing season we were there to be ready for us when we were there. And while we were there, one of the things we had, breakfast was my favorite meal, um, just because I like the egg, we had eggs and what they called bacon, but it was basically Canadian, Canadian bacon, ham, um, and then yogurt. They make fresh yogurt every day. It was just unbelievably good. But um, Camp 2, we're at 21,300 feet, fresh eggs. Some Sherpa carried, some porter carried eggs through the ice ball just so I could have my fried eggs. I mean, it's just, they're amazing. It's just amazing. But we got weathered in um, because of this. We had, to, we had to wait for the weather, wait for a window. Now we're at Camp 2. They're trying to predict when the weather is going to be good on the summit, you know, during the night of the summit. So they have to look ahead in the weather forecast. Very tricky. And all the teams are using good weather forecasting now. Um, bad teams basically watch what the good teams do and then try and jump in line and, and kind of follow them. But it's a, it's a dicey game because we have these tornadoes, these um, typhoons, I mean, these tropical storms 
lashing the upper part of the mountain when you just can't move. And a very experienced, Steve House, a very experienced mountaineer once said, what's the most important element of success? And he listed these things. The number one most important thing is the weather. When the mountain doesn't cooperate, you don't go anywhere. So they're trying to pick the right thing. This was a, this is a, this is a picture basically of the move once we started moving from camp two to camp three. This, I was trying to show how steep it is. This is actually 2019. The day we did this climb, it looked like this. You can see that, you know, those people aren't moving very fast, but that was okay with me, all right? I mean, it was just, it's just sheer ice. The snow actually helped because it gave us some footholds, some, some places place to, to stand. And we got to a place, Camp 3, at 24,500 feet. This was the scariest place I've ever been in my whole life. I, I just can't tell you. I just can't tell you what it was like. First of all, it was completely covered with snow. Everything was snowed up. The vestibules, the, the snow had been driven into the vestibules. They had to use shovels. They couldn't use their hands. They had to use shovels to dig it out. It was packed so tightly. It was really fine grain. The wind was howling. It's very, very steep. There's a line of rope running right through the middle of the camp where the tents are. So you can reach out of your tent and clip in before you basically stand up so you don't fall 5,000 feet. It, it isn't like you fall all the way back down to camp two. The way the valley sets up, the mountain sets up, you start down and you take a left-hand turn, okay? Because I have a, like a piece of equipment that's somewhere down over there. <laughs> you know, I, it's not where I wanted to go. It just was so, and this is picture, it looks like it's, it looks like the camera's tilted because of the strata on Noopsy behind it. That was taken horizontally. That's what this camp was like. It was terrifying. Actually, um, other than that, it was, yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was great. But I, uh, I woke up, we were there, we were stuck there for two nights. And that was really, that was really tough, a big storm. My tent mate, Kevin, he's this most amazing guy. He can sleep under any conditions. I was talking about this the other night. I woke up at about two or three o'clock. Oh, first of all, he climbed up there before I had, and our tents were all aligned on the, in a row on the mountain, the surface had put them in, you know, one below the other. And Kevin, thinking, hey, I'm here first, I'm taking the primo spot, I'll take the top tent. Bad idea, okay, because the wind was like, all the snow was piling up. We were the blockade for everybody else. I woke up at two o'clock in the morning, I heard this, and it's like, because uh, his head was at the foot, my head was at the, at the vestibule, and I had the snow was blowing in on me. And uh, so I kind of turned on my headlamp and snow is just blasting into the, into the vestibule. There was an opening down below and it's driving snow in. The vestibule was half full of snow. So I said, you know, to myself, okay, let's get some of the snow out of here. So I reached over to try and get it. It was like trying to move concrete. Then I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, this thing is going to fill up. We're going to be stuck inside this tent. We'll have to cut our way out like some kind of, you know, you know, in a crocodile Dundee or something like that. In the middle of the night, this storm on, you know, steep stuff. I wasn't digging this too much. I look over at Kevin. The tent has collapsed down on him. He's lying flat. The tent is down on him like this because of the weight of the snow. And on my side, there's this giant cavity that the wind has carved out. So it's not, so the tent floor, had, I was kind of like over here. It's like down here. I'm, I'm ready for the whole thing to just go like this, you know, just tumble bumble. And uh, I mean, it was, it was scary. It was really scary. Like, hey, Kevin, Kevin, you okay? And he, and he goes, hits, you know, hits his head on the snow. What? <laughs> you know, I said, can you breathe? He goes, he's got his mask on. He's got his ears on. What? Can you breathe? And he's like, can you breathe? Yeah. <laughs> this guy is so imp imp imperturbable. It's just so great. Um, yeah, that was not a that was not a good situation. That was not a good. I was so happy to get out there. Here's a picture taken. Look, this is the New York Times. Uh, we were talking about this, the caterpillar, the other day. I think Chuck, somebody, you know, defined it as a caterpillar. This was taken 2021 from camp, the top of camp three. When I saw this picture, you know, because I was there, so I saw this. I thought, that, that's, that's not real. That, that, you know, that didn't actually happen. And what I didn't really realize at the time, um, that is what happened. And when we took off for our climb, you know, you're behind other climbers. It looks like it would be this terrible situation. But that's actually not how it is. You know, you're not moving very fast. It's very, very steep. We're trying to go up around that rock on the right called the Geneva Spur and over to that saddle, which is called the South Call, with kind of the ridge of Everest in the, in the middle there. Um, it didn't feel like you were way at the back of the bus. It just didn't feel like that. But 
you know, people tend to all move together. So you do get these situations. The morning we left Camp 3, it was still snowing and blowing. It doesn't look like this. Our tents are on the right in the red there. That's the rope running through the uh, middle of the camp that you have to attach yourself to as soon as you stand up so you don't fly down the hill. So we took off. You got this big, over on the left-hand side, you may be able to see. See how it gets that really steep part? This is solid ice. That's solid ice. Um, but the sun came out. And um, this is kind of looking back as we got a little bit higher and you start to see how steep it is. But because it's solid ice, everything turned into kind of this like sugar plum fairy castle kind of thing with twinkling ice and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, meanwhile, you're breathing hard and working hard and this steep place. It was it was um, it was kind of an odd, odd sensation. Um, it got higher. You can start to see that's the Noopsy Ridge on the left hand side. We're starting to get really up there. Um, Pumori is is lost down there below us in the clouds making an oxygen bottle change. And now we're heading for camp four. In this picture on the right hand side uh, on the horizon is Choyu, another 8,000 meter peak. So we're now at 26,000 feet. And you'll see that there's not a lot of snow on the ground. All right, there's a reason for that. It's like Kansas, okay? The wind <laughs> never stops up there, it blows all the time. So the snow, the only snow that's there is the snow that's captured when people step on something and kind of compress it. Other than that, it just blows through there. It's just like a Venturi. It rips the tents apart. Here's a Sherpa trying to make his way the last few steps to Camp 4, just trying to stand up. And you can see in this picture what it does to the vestibules, because it can get under the vestibules and just rips them apart. They're all torn up. Yeah, that's where we're supposed to go. Yeah. So the route out to the summit, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you can see. Again, see how the rocks are there, but there's one little patch of uh, one little trail of ice uh, of snow. That's because that's where people step on the snow. Other than that, the wind just you know because it's this huge Venturi effect. But we're going to go up. I'm going to try and show you with my um, with my cursor here. You can see some climbers here. Uh, this is not roped here, but basically standing over here, you basically rope up and then you go up this very steep couloir here. Take a right hand turn to a place called the balcony, which is basically the only flat place you're going to stand on. Um, until you get back to Camp 4. And I'm talking about the summit too. I'll talk about that in a minute. Then up this ridge, whoops, where'd I go? Up this ridge, to this is called the South Summit. You can't see the actual summit when you're climbing across, where'd it go, come back here, um, to the Hillary Step and then up to the top. All right, here's another picture taken, Alan Arnett, who covers a lot of this stuff, gives you an idea of this route. So if you look here, you're coming at the balcony, you have to climb along this steep ridge and you start to get a feeling for how steep it is here, up to the south summit, along the Cornus Ridge. We're going to show, show you that, the Hillary Step, and then to the top. All right, so now you've, again, I started at, uh, they got me up at 8 o'clock at night to leave at 10. So I think three or four, three of us left at uh, 8, I uh, left at 10. Uh, the rest of the team left at 12. You know why? Because we are slow, okay? We, left, we had to leave early. So I started at 8, and I was not ready to go at 10 o'clock. Because you get at this point three people in a tent. Had Kevin and I were in there, and a giant guy, one of our guys, it's really huge, was in the middle and just trying to get all the stuff. Just took more than two hours to get it ready. The wind is howling. The winds were supposed to abate. They didn't. Um, just standing up was really tough. In fact, one of the guys who left kind of at the same about the same time ended up with um, scratch corneas because the snow was driven in behind his goggle. It was blowing so much. But it did, it did diminish about 2 a.m., I think. But you're climbing from 10 you know, to 12. You're dealing with oxygen. Um, but just, you know, I don't have enough time. I'll tell you a story at some point about changing oxygen on the balcony. That was really tough. And then you're climbing and climbing and climbing. And all you can really see is you get this little pool of headlight, a headlight um, illumination. And you can hear the sound of the people in front of you. You can see the person in front of you. You can kind of hear the person behind you. I've got two Sherpas now. I've got my Raider Sherpa, and I've got the guy who actually did all the work, and he's there because to help, but also because it's a big deal to the Sherpas now to actually get to the top. They get paid more money, get a lot of prestige. It's good for their reputation, so they want to go to the top. They don't want to just do the work and, and go home. They want to go do the work, get the money, gamble, and then go home. So they actually <laughs> but, um, but they're just so great. So, you know, I'm going along. It was, it was hard. It was hard. It's really, really steep. When I walked over to the place where you where you actually hook into the fixed line, 
here, here's what I did. In, at night, on a mountain like Everest or in other mountains, and you've done some climbing, you can see people's headlamps for miles. And I looked up where I was going to have to climb up this, up, this, up this ridge right here. And I can kind of see where I have to go. Um, and I can see all the headlamps. And I, I swear, I walked over. And I look, I'm looking at the headlamps, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm, and I'm looking, and I'm looking like this. And I'm not kidding. This felt to me like I was looking up an elevator shaft. It was so steep. And I decided not to look up anymore because that was too. <laughs> that was just so discouraging. You just can't believe. What's that feeling? You're in the middle of the night. The wind is blowing. But finally, what happens is something really special happens. Really special. This little thin line comes. You know, in the east, and you realize the sun's going to come up. I'm getting, uh, actually, I'm getting uh, kind of chills here just thinking about it again. Um, you realize the sun is going to come up. You're going to see another day. Uh, it's just the most, I don't know, um, powerful emotional feeling. It's just that this was a really special moment because you've been working and grinding, and I was focused, okay? I know that four people had already died. Two of them had already been to the top. They've been to the top and died after they got to the top and come down. I didn't want to be those guys. And I was doing this not having had the experience to know how I'd respond to this. So I was really trying to focus on how I was doing and whether I was monitoring myself and you know, all that stuff. Seeing that sun was a big deal. It's another picture taken about the same time, looking back toward um, Makalu. And you can see the line of climbers coming up from the balcony. The sun is up, but they still got their headlamps on. It just gives you an idea of what it typically looks like. And this is looking over at Lhotse. I didn't take this picture, but that cool bar, you can see the headlamps in the cool bar. And the great thing about us, we were just on the other side of the rock that's on the left-hand side here, actually in the sunlight. But Wolf and the guys climbing Lhotse, people climbing Lhotse, were still in the shade. It's steep, it's cold, it's really, it's a really heavy duty deal. So I'm following along, I'm in this, I'm in this line, I'm behind this woman who's on the left, you can kind of see, I took this picture, Look at these rocks. I've been climbing for a long time. Oops, what happened there? Are we okay? I'm okay here. I don't know about you guys. I guess you got something else going on. I don't know what the deal is. Um, Joseph is saying, I've, I've hosted enough, I guess. Oh, that's the library. Okay. Um, did I not return to the library book? Is that what's happening? Maybe? I don't know. Anyway, I'm looking at these rocks and I'm thinking, I don't know. Is that, is that, the, could that be the South Summit? I mean, I'm moving along. It doesn't feel like, you know, that much time has gone by. Um, and I'm saying, I kind of, I hope that's the South Summit, but I don't know. I haven't been here before. And I was going to go around this woman. she had gone a little bit slower than I was. And I did one of those things where you kind of say, hey, wait a minute. What are you, what are you thinking? You're going to go around her? It's like when somebody passes you to go right in front of you and go to the stoplight. Exactly that kind of thing. Everybody comes to a stop. So I calmed down a little bit, followed her, walked up to this rock, and this is what I saw. I saw, the, I saw this cornice ridge. And for me... This was the big moment. People ask me what it was like to be on top. Um, this was the moment. I knew where I was. I mean, I'm getting the chills to think about it. I, I'm sorry. I just, it's just such a powerful uh, 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 emotion. OK, OK. Um, but I knew that we were going to get to the top. I was going to get to the top because I knew what this was. I knew what the, where the Hillary step, step was. And I could see the summit from here. So that was a big deal. This is actually uh, some other views. Just to give you an idea, this wasn't taken. Our, this is why you don't pass on the Cornice Ridge. Um, <laughs> down here, you can see there's a body still clipped to the lines here. You kind of can't make it out. It's not very clear. But yeah, we actually, four people had died. Um, uh, 350 people, 309 people, I think, have died on Everest. Uh, most of the bodies are still there. It's impossible to take them off. We just can't take them off. And they don't just cut them and send them down into the abyss. Um, there are different, you know, Basically, what happens eventually the ropes will break and you know tear, and sometimes people will fall off. But um, one of the climbers, um, a Swiss Canadian, kind of a Swiss Canadian, um, the, his, his body was still there. We basically didn't have to walk over, but it's still there, you know, frozen in the snow. He had climbed and, and summited and just collapsed. So I didn't want to be that guy either. So um, I was actually kind of watching it. The next. I just found out we don't have much time, so I'm going to just try and get us to the top here. Um, Hillary Step, iconic place. You've all heard of it. That used to be a much more difficult part of the climb when uh, named after Edmund Hillary, of course. Uh, 
But now it, uh, earthquake in 2015 knocked a lot of the rocks off, so it's not as challenging as it was. It's still a it's still a bottleneck. We had some trouble coming down, so we'll get boxed in there. And then you get finally to the final summit ridge. This picture is taken from the top, looking back down. It's actually much steeper than it looks. But I want to show you this video that a friend of mine and a Canadian filmmaker made, uh, just to give you an idea near the top, kind of what the feeling is, and how hard how hard people are working. The Kumbu cough because of the dry air and the high and the high altitude. Cornice Ridge, you get a lot of, typically get a lot of wind as you come out of the protection of the other side of the mountain. It's a one-way street. It's really difficult to pass. That's why they have these big bottlenecks when people come, you know, and aren't very experienced about passing. It be really, but this guy gives you an idea. Using the Jumar. I got past that, got to the top. This is my picture taken from the top with uh, Pasang Ote, my uh, Sherpa, 8 o'clock on uh, May 23rd. And the other Sherpa that was with me, Dawa Bote. Um, as I said, my job at that point was to get down the mountain. Other people, our guide spent two hours on the, when he got there, he got there behind me a little bit. He spent two hours on the summit. I spent seven minutes. You know, I didn't know what was going to happen, and I didn't want to. I didn't, what happened to those guys that died from exhaustion? Did they just collapse? Did they know what was going to happen? My job was to, you know, get home. So, uh, as I said, the South Summit was the big moment emotionally for me. And then I just want to show you, I'll show you one more. I think we have to um, quit at that point. This picture is taken of Mount Everest from Lhotse. And again, the thing that I don't think a lot of people realize is just how steep this, this big baby is. You know, you look at that. And you can see pictures from the north side where it looks like it's very long. The mountain's actually kind of long and horizontal. But the actual summit pyramid is a triangle. It's very, very steep on all sides. All right, I think, Stephanie, you want me to wrap it up with that, right? Okay. All right, well, she's going to leave me on top of the mountain. All right. <laughs> you're never, never going to find out.